Outstanding cattle at 59 and a quarter. On the heifers, choice and prime, 975 and up, 56 to 58 bucks, with one load at 58 and a quarter. They could read and write, you know. Now, we come down here and let's see what happened on the cattle that we moved out of the area. Told you, we didn't have any place to go. We moved them out of the area. 450 miles out of the area. Them steers, weighing 1,230 pounds, brought the man 6,128. The heifers, weighing 1,100 pounds, brought that producer 59 and a quarter. I had another load of heifers in that same day. Not quite the quality, just a little bit lighter, 1,063 pounds. They brought 57.82. This load of heifers here at the 57.82, I've had six loads from that man since that went to the same place. Moved him out of the area. He said, yes. So he made $2.50 a hundred on the steers. They made a buck to a buck and a half, a hundred over the terminal tops on the heifers. But 450 miles, the freight's gonna kill me. I can't haul cattle that far. Well, let's see. Our freight to the Joliet Yards, 85 cents a hundred. The freight 450 miles out, negotiated by the National Farmers Organization on a backhaul. A buck a hundred. 15 cents a hundred difference. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the program today. This is what's available for you today. If you'll put your cattle on an inventory and let the negotiators work with them and bargain with them. Now I've brought you out some of the successes that we've had, what's taking place. But as we put our people back out into the country and I go out and I evaluate cattle I'm finding some things that I don't like, and I'm going to discuss it with you. Now, I'm positive there's none of you sitting in this room that would do this. But you look at me as a cattle buyer, and I'm not a cattle buyer. You want me to come out and bid your cattle? I'm not going to bid your cattle. We get back into that old habit, don't we? Here, this man's going to come out. He's going to evaluate our cattle, so he's a buyer. To give you an example of that, short time ago I was out, first time on the man's farm, called and wanted me to look at his cattle. Naturally, he wanted a live bid. Sir, I do not bid live. I do not bid. I evaluated his cattle. I asked him to give me till the next noon to bargain for the cattle. Told him what I would try to do, and I'd get back with him by noon the next day. The type of cattle he had, what I did is I bargained out with a packer a floor price on a flat bid. But we would rail the cattle, and if they did better than what the flat bid was, he got that too. He had a guaranteed floor, with an open top. If the cattle did better than what it looked like, he was gonna get it. I called him back and told him. Well, it ends up I didn't get the cattle. He was one of them habitual sellers, I guess. You know, he went back to old Joe where he always went. Well, let it be as it is. A Couple of weeks later, I was in having a sandwich in a restaurant, and lo and behold, he comes in and sits down beside me. I struck up a conversation with him. He says, you sure look familiar, but he says, I can't place you. Again, I reintroduced myself. I told him I was at the National Farmers Organization. I'd been out and evaluated his cattle a couple of weeks earlier. Oh, yes, he says, that's right. He says, don't you think, he says, that you could get a lot more cattle bought if you'd come out and bid them live? Sir, I said, you didn't remember what I told you when I was there. 
Yeah, but he says, darn, you're good. He says, you hit them cattle right on the nose. The reason I hit the cattle on the nose is I evaluated them the same as what the buyer told him they were, I suppose. I made this statement to him. I said, if I was to make money for myself, or if I wanted to make money for the packer, I would bid your cattle live. But remember, I'm working for you. You, the producer, is the one that's paying my where my paycheck comes from. I'm working for you. And my duty is to get you every cent that them cattle are worth, or that I can bargain out for them that day. <laughs> yeah, he says, that's right. You did tell me that, didn't you? Ladies and gentlemen, we do not buy cattle. We do not bid cattle, but we bargain for cattle. And let's remember that and discuss that with our neighbors. Now, I want to come to the place as to what we need to do. I'm going to get down to the nitty gritty. We've got some 200 collection points across this nation. And you know we're not using them as we need to use them. That collection point should be the hub of the activity. That collection point should be used for that producer that's got less than load lots. I've been speaking mostly here earlier on the load lot shippers and up. But let's come down to that man that doesn't feed that many cattle maybe that he sells a load lot at a time. He can still be feeding out a couple hundred head of cattle a year, but only moving 15, 20 topping out at a time. Or you can take that man that, that uh, has a load lot shipper also, but he's always got a few right at the beginning to top off, and he's got a few at the end. It's a pretty well-known fact that the less than load lot shipper The cattle that are bought from him will be the cheapest cattle a packer buys. Normally, he's not on the market often enough to know what it is or where it should be, and they're going to slough them off. Now, you know if you only got 10 head of cattle, they ain't worth as much as that man has got 40, don't you? That's what they'll tell you. But you can have just as much clout as with them 10 head as what the man can have that ships a pot load a week by using your collection points. Now, I want to talk a little bit about when you use these collection points, too. Let's schedule the cattle. Let's not call that collection point the afternoon before when they're going to run the next morning and say, I got 10, 15 head of cattle that I got to bring in. I just got to sell them because you know what? We cannot do a good job for you. You're dumping them. That's what you're expecting us to do. That's not our program. This is what I've been talking about. Let's go back. That transparency that Steve used here to where we divided the state up. We're going to divide it again, but this time it's a collection point area within that state. We can take the four sections, we can use one point in them. It makes no difference how many we use, but we're going to use four for practical purposes today. Now what we need is we need an inventory around that collection point. We need to know how many cattle you got around there, when they're going to be ready. On that inventory, that should consist of the man's name, number of head of cattle, approximate weight, sex of the cattle, and intent, intended marketing time, let's put it that way. Now, when the rep, myself, or whoever it is, spends a day in that area, want to go along, 
around and I want to see them cattle. I want to evaluate them cattle in the yards so that we know what we got. This happens in, around every collection point within this area here or within the reps area. We do it a little bit ahead of time. We don't do it just two days. Don't try to do it just a couple days ahead of time. We try to do it out ahead of time far enough that if I've got 10 head of heavy steers here, I got 15 over here, 10 down here, or whatever it may be, that I can put a load of heavy steers together, put them to the right pack, or I can put a load of light heifers together, a load of heavy heifers. We know where they are. And a packer's needing that type of cattle, then you can bargain with him. See the power that you've got when you do it systematically? When you have an inventory and you know what you got? And where to put them? That's all I'm saying. What I'm saying here is that that less than load lot producer, I've seen time after time when a man out there with two or three head of cattle will pick up more than his year's dues on one shipment. Look what you can be doing for your fellow producers by using your collection points. Then these 200 collection points we got scattered throughout the United States, we need to cluster them together, four or five, six points, whatever will work within that area. What I'm talking clustering in here, you work together then, and I'm using this up in the eastern part of Iowa, Farley, Cascade, Greeley, and Amber, we make loads up every week between them four points. And we've went a little bit farther. We've got a state right catty corner across that they call Wisconsin, and lo and behold, you know, they got some of the same programs over there that we got in Iowa. That's the beauty of the nationwide system. They're the same. And you know, they've got a contract over there out of them collection points for hogs that go into Cedar Rapids. Now, Cedar Rapids is just a little bit beyond the four collection points I'm talking about. So this week we've come up with two and a half loads of cattle. We got that half a load. What do we do? What do we do? We coordinate with Iowa or with uh, Wisconsin. Happens to be that they got just a half a load too. Them trucks as they come back from Cedar Rapids dumping, uh, unloading the hogs, and they come back through Cedar Rapids. They stop at the collection points. They pick up the half a load of cattle. They go on into Wisconsin, pick up the other half a load, and right into Green Bay. These are things that can be worked if we work together. Use our imagination. You can sure use it at other times. We've sure used it when it comes to producing. Let's use it when it comes to marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be amazed at what can take place. I've touched just slightly on this inventory around the collection point. They've got a collection point meeting here today in room 218, I believe it is, it's taking place. If you haven't been there, I recommend that you make that meeting. Learn more about the inventory and how to use your collection points. It's very important that we do this. Now I want to summarize here a little bit as to what we've said. We've discussed several things, but let's go back and let's put it all together. And as we summarize it, through the National Farmers Program, we've got a program for all shippers, regardless of size. The man ships two head of cattle a year if he ships a load every week. The program's available. You, used, you use the home office for centralized bargaining. You know how Steve said the feedlots worked? Centralized selling. This is centralized bargaining. Number two, you needn't worry if you can't get a buyer to come into your yard or if the pack and plant closes where you're going to sell. If you've got the cattle on the inventory, then it's up to us. That's what you're paying us to do. 
is to bargain for them cattle where we can do you the best job. You can get your cattle evaluated in your yard or in your lot. If you got load lots, you can do it. Maybe today on your own. But how many of you of the five, ten heads going to get a buyer to come out and look at them? Kill information. You get a kill sheet back, you know how your cattle graded, you know what the yields are. You sell them to that sale barn, you never know. You sell them to a buyer, maybe. Usually they'll give you one or two answers. They did about as I expected, or they just didn't work for me, right? Here you get the accurate information. You have trust protected payment. With the ep economic conditions we have today, I'm sure there's not a one of us that can afford to lose a part of a cattle check or any portion of it. Very important. In transit insurance. Some cattle are on the truck, they're insured. It's all included in the program. You have negotiations with the latest negotiators with the latest marketing information. What we're saying here is negotiators are dealing every day with packers from coast to coast. They've got a feel for the market. You as an individual can't have. You've got other things to do. You know what it says on the radio when you hear it, but lo and behold, you don't. It's higher to lower. This is what's included in our program today. And through this program, back to that old race and marketing again, and we're a nose out ahead. But you know what? If we're going to stay that nose out ahead, we've got to start telling people about our program. Devon said last night that we've got the best program in the nation and nobody knows it, the best kept secret in the nation and nobody knows about it. And that's right. Now who's going to tell them? I'm sure you're not going to see it flashed out across the TV screens. I'm sure you're not going to see it in the headlines of the newspaper. Or coming over the radio. So if you're not going to find it there, it kind of goes back that we're going to have to tell them ourselves, aren't we? And what's so bad about that? What's so bad about telling that neighbor that you've got something good for him? and then ask him to try it. Don't just tell him about it and then say it's not for you. But be a part of it. Ask him. How long has it been since you've asked somebody to try it? How long has it been? This is my challenge to you. That as you go back home, you put this structure together around your collection points. You tell your fellow producers about the programs that we got and ask them to try it. You know, I spend quite a bit of time in the car, too, traveling. As I said, I'm Western Illinois, Eastern Iowa, been on some of the procurement teams, different states. And I heard Norman Vincent Peale one evening. He made the statement and ask the question, what are the 10 most important two-letter words in the English language? You know what they are? The 10 most important two-letter words in the English language. If it is to be, it is up to me. Now think about it. If when we come back to the convention next year, if we want to be a nose ahead, in this marketing game, every one of you go home 
And if it is to be, it is up to me. And if we work together like this, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be there. I thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Awful powerful words, aren't they? If it is to be, it's up to me. We've heard uh, Dwayne and Steve discuss the ability that the member has in marketing through the organization. Whether he be a load lot seller or an individual that will sell one cow. We know what the advantages are. We've seen them in the past. I was fortunate enough this early spring to be asked to speak at a marketing seminar in Sauk City, Wisconsin. And in this seminar, there were two marketing agencies and a professor and in uh, economics from the University of Wisconsin. His name was Dr. Beagie. And the University of Wisconsin made a chart on who I call it who is who in marketing. This chart indicated on the normal spread. Of course, in a market, you will see a spread of maybe one to two dollars. Now, this survey that they took showed who was on the bottom of that spread and who was on the top. Dr. Beagie's figures on that, I'm going to use choice steers ranging from 95 to 97 dollars. Dr. Beagie's report showed that an individual selling less than 10 head would be basically on this part of the market. An individual selling 10 head or more would be approximately on this part of the market. And an individual who would be selling more than 10 head but kept a relationship with that buyer would be here. Not only did he need to keep the relationship with the buyer, but he needed to keep informed in the market. This is what the national farmers can do for you folks. We can make that 10 head 1,000 head. We have the ability to keep un informed in the markets. We have qualified staff in the field for you. Collective bargaining isn't a hobby of us, it's obsession. It gets to the point where you know it works, why can't somebody do something about it? And the reason I'm saying that is probably the closest thing to the truest form of collective bargaining we have in the slaughter cattle division is our call cow program. That program starts from one cow and one member, and it builds the volume step by step up through, I believe last week we marketed around 1,800 head in, a, in, one, in one plant. This is an example of markets since 1980 through 1982 of the cull-cow market compiled by the uh, USDA's Market and Reporting Service out of Wisconsin on this side right here. And the National Farmers Organization's average price on this side. The range would be from $5.78 in January of 1980 to 3 cents in December 
of 1980. We have more months and more years than this compiled, but due to the size of the transparency, it was just impossible to put on. The significant part of this transparency isn't the spread, but in this particular case, not one of the 34 months that is seen here has been under the market, under the average compiled by the University of Wisconsin, or the USDA, pardon me. And then two years back, we will find one month. So from 1978 to, that, to the present time, the National Farmers members were receiving well above the average market in Wisconsin, simply through collective bargaining. We can take that one cow and turn it into a thousand cows. That gives you clout in the marketplace. One cow means absolutely nothing to a buyer, but a thousand cows means an awful lot to them, folks. We're running a little late. I'm going to sum summarize this up. And then I'd like to show some slides on carcass evaluation. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you all a favor. I'm going to ask you to go to a friend when you get home, or that neighbor, and ask him where he sold his last load of cattle. And when he tells you, ask him when he sold the one before that and the one before that. And talk to him about habitual selling. If he won't go through the organization, tell him to at least check other markets or other organizations. Stop him from destroying the markets that we're trying to build. Steve said the two most dangerous aspects in this whole industry is liquidation selling and habitual, and the habitual seller. And I agree 100%. If you point it out to him, I'm sure he's going to stop and think himself and consider you as a good friend and have done him a favor. I want to thank you very much for coming. There'll be a four o'clock meeting here with the commissioner. I better get that right. Let me, it's Cato Heinemann. He was the individual that Walt talked about who asked the organization's advice on the board. Cato will be in here along with Walt and they'll be discussing forward contracts. Why don't we just stand up a little bit and I'm gonna get this projector moving for you. Now these are actual steers that were butchered, fro uh, not really froze, but chilled, and then cut up. This side view shows a frozen carcass after it's been skinned and the head and shanks removed. The black lines illustrate the various positions along the carcass and where they were sectioned. It should be noted that all sections were made from right angles of the body, starting with the rear and working forward. Through the bulge of the round, through the stifle joint, and at the point of the hip bone, between the 12th and 13th rib, the foreflank, which is approximately the sixth rib, and the point of the shoulder. The rear view of this frozen skin carcass again shows the lack of fullness over the round and the rump, the tremendous depth and fullness of the twist and fullness in the lower part of the body and the round, and somewhat rectangular in shape. There is a rather heavy covering of fat over the top of the rump and the muscling through the top of the rump lacks thickness and fullness. Also. It is to be noted that there is a fair amount of finish over the outside of the rear quarter and a considerable amount of seam 
fat between the muscles. This is at the section of the stifle joint. The covering of fat over the back of the animal and over the side of the rump continues to be quite heavy. There is an extreme amount of fat in the area of the twist and the lower part of the cross section, while the lower part of the round is poorly muscled. This section is made at the point of the hip bone and carries straight through the flank of the carcass. We note the continuation of thick covering over the fat and the back, and more particular at the edge of the loin. An extremely amount of thick layer of fat appears in the flank region. This very thick flank would show a mark of fullness as the animal would move. This section is between the 12th and the 13th rib. This section is made where the carcass would normally be ribbed when slaughtered in the customary manner. This section shows again the extreme amount of covering of fat over the ribeye. The fat is 1.5 inches thick and the loin eye area is 10.6 square inches. Note the extreme thickness, particularly down and over the rib and lack of muscling and meatiness in the lower rib and plate area. Here's, there is an extreme amount of fat over the outside of the rib and shoulder. There is a heavy infiltration of fat between the muscling, particularly in the lower part of the forerib and brisket. Even when the fat is trimmed from the outside of, the, of this carcass, the roasts obtained from the part of the carcass, there will still be seam fat and fat between the muscling. This section is made at the point of the shoulder with the picture taken forward toward the rear of the animal rather than forward. There has been a heavy infiltration of fat between the muscling and rather marked deficiency of muscling and heavy deposits of fat in the brisket area. The percentage of fat to bone ratio after the carcass has been sectioned and the entire carcass was then separated into three component parts, the fat, lean, and bone. This side shows a physical composition of this carcass, which was 43% lean, 44% fat, and 13% bone. Again, it should be pointed out that the very heavy ratio of fat to lean and certainly more than one would expect on the average animal. Again, look at the 43% lean versus the 44% fat. This skinned and frozen carcass from the second steer is marked off in the same locations as the first carcass. It should be noted that we have more round uniform bulge on the round and somewhat lack of extreme fullness through the rear of the flank. This slide shows a more rounded appearance of the rear view of the, as compared to the square rectangular shape as that have been a desirable characteristics of the animals in the past. The, thickness, the thickest part of the round is through the center. Note the general round contour of black ribbon over the top of the rump and down the side of the rear quarter. Also note that the steer is wide between the hind legs and not extremely deep in the twist. One will note the round appearance in the section, in this section through the round which is flatter appearance of the muscle over the top of the rump, the section shows less fat and less outside covering over the top and down over the side to the legs. There is also less fat in the area of the cod and twist with a more heavily muscled lower round. 
This section shows only a thin covering of fat over the top of the rump and over the outside of the round. Also, one should note that the rel relatively small amount of fat in the twist and cod area. The hip bone. The flanks of this steer are noticeably trim and very little fat separating the thin muscling over the top of the loin and through the uniform covering of fat. At the area of the 12th and 13th rib, the ribeye measures 13 and a half square inches and is covered by 0 0.75 inches of fat. This section is made from the foreflank in the area of the 6th rib. The carcass is well muscled with a thin covering of fat over the outside. Observe the trimness in the brisket and chuck area. <coughs> Although there is some amount of fat between the muscling in this section, there is more muscling than there in the previous carcass. There is some fat in the brisket area, but not to a excessive, not not in an excessive in this section. The fat to lean to bone ratio on this carcass was 60% lean, 26% fat, and 14% bone. This Hereford Angus crossbred steer weighed 1,110 pounds. It appears to be fairly fat and is fairly deep in the fore and rear flanks. It is also fairly deep bodied. The percent of fat to lean to bone, the physical composition of this carcass was 54% lean, 31% fat, and 15% bone. Many of you people have asked how they can tell the difference of a Holstein in the cooler versus your English bread or crossbred cattle. This standing carcass picture shows a larger shank taller bodied animal with little fat covering covering the muscles and the rounds and a very thin in the lower round area and twist. This Holstein carcass was separated into the lean fat and bone, had 15% lean, 25% fat, and 16% bone. Note the length of the rump and the hooks to the pin and length of the body of this animal. This view of the crossbred carcass shows the thickness and width when viewed from the rear. The carcass may not be uniform in width. This lack of uniformity should not deteriorate from the carcass value. The animal and its carcass should have a maximum development in the loins and the round area. This section through the round shows an extreme muscling in this animal and only a thin covering of fat over the round. Through the stifled joint, the extreme muscling continues, especially in the stifled area, shown in the lower part of this slide. Also note the rounded appearance over the back of the carcass and a thin covering of fat. At the point of the hip bone, we see a very full, thick loin and only a thin, fl thin flank and in, in the lower area. Between the 12th and the 13th rib, at the 12th rib, we have seen the loin eye of 14.5 square inches and fat thickness of 0 0.5 inch. Note the natural muscling, and muscling in the lower rib and through the plate area. The rib between the fifth and sixth rib, we see very, we see 
very muscular chuck and a minimum amount of outside seam fat. With a very trim brisket, the retailer would have little difficulty in merchandising cuts like this. The point of the shoulder completes the section of this very trim, muscular animal. 66% lean, 18% fat, 16% bone. Carcass and a ribeye of a yield grade five steer. You may want to take a few little notes on, on some of these. This yield grade, it's a yield grade five. The carcass weighed 750 pounds. It had a fat thickness of 1.1 inches, a ribeye area of 10.9 square inch, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat of 5%. That would be 5% of its body weight. This animal is a yield grade 5.6, the quality grade of a choice. The carcass and ribeye of a yield grade three steer. This yield grade three carcass weighed 700 pounds, fat thickness of 0 0.6 inch, ribeye area of 11.8 inch, kidney, pelvic, and heart fat of 3.5 inch, uh, pardon me, 3.5 percent. This animal is a yield grade 3.6 with a quality grade of choice. Yield grade one ribeye and carcass. It's a yield grade one. Carcass weighs 645 pounds. Ribeye area of 13.9 square inch. Kidney, pelvic, and heart fat of 2.5% with a yield grade of 1.5 and a quality grade of choice. Mel, put the lights on, please. I want to thank you all again for coming. I know it becomes a, quite a financial hardship, especially in times like this. But I hope you'll feel that it's all worth your while when it's all done. And I hope you'll take something back with you from us that'll do you some good in the country. Appreciate you coming very much. Thank you.